Hello and welcome back for another episode of LiDAR for Metal Detectorists. So, you'll remember if you've watched the last video about Karis Viewer, it's a great bit of kit, it's a great bit of software, and I may have slightly slated QGIS in that video. But QGIS is a massive open source platform for um, GIS work, LiDAR work, etc. But it can be overwhelming and it can be cumbersome. However, I think I've come up with a way for you to get the most out of it in the easiest and quickest way possible. So play along with me and we'll get you some decent LiDAR for your area. First of all, what you need to do is download the latest uh, stable version or long term release, if you like, uh, and that will be the standalone in installer here. Um, you can see the web address on the top, but I'll make sure it's in the description too. Uh, grab that standalone installer version. However, the QGIS website itself can be very slow. I would suggest using a mirror if you possibly can, and I'll also include the link to that. Um, and download, go through that, install it as per, as per the defaults. Whilst that's doing that, what I'd suggest you do is go and grab some LiDAR data. Now, us, for us in the UK, the DEFRA survey data is the main source of LiDAR for what we have. You may have a different source of LiDAR. I'm sure you do if you're not in the UK. Um, but for the purposes of this video, we're going to use this data and I'm going to use my old favourite, which is Danebury Hillfort, um, which is uh, up in Hampshire. Uh, because it's got a good array of different things going on, um, it's interesting to look at. But what I'm going to do here, rather than just download the one square that has Danebury in, I want to grab two. So in order to do that, I just click the little pen icon over on the right hand side. Click and hold the left button and draw across both squares. In doing that, click and get available tiles. That will grab both squares worth of data for me. So when this loads up, there'll be two options. There'll be DSM tiles and DTM tiles. Which ones do you need? Well, DSM tiles are a digital surface model and they include all the buildings, all the trees, etc. And as a metal detectorist, you probably don't want that. Uh, what I tend to use would be the DTM files and the composite ones here because it's a digital terrain map and that shows the surface. It strips away all the surface things like buildings, like um, uh, trees, etc. And you can see what's going on underneath. So that's definitely the better option. For us uh, at this area, one meter is the best resolution. If you've got a lower resolution, brilliant, grab it. Um, grab it with both hands. There's some amazing data out there, just not in this area. And then click on both of these here. You'll download the data, uh, extract both of them into the same place in a folder you can come back to uh, in a minute. Once you've done that, load up QGIS and you'll be presented with something that looks along the lines of this. Pretty daunting, a lot of tools going on, um, probably a lot of menus that don't make too much sense to you right now. Well, the easiest way to get started is go and grab your LiDAR data. Once you've extracted it, you'll have something that looks roughly like this. And I'm not even going to filter it. I'm just going to select all the files, click and drag them straight in to here. The first thing I'm going to get is what kind of uh, reference do I want to use? And um, for this one, the British National Grid, which is suggesting is right. So I'm just going to click OK. And it's going to import those LiDAR, file, LiDAR files. Now, you'll remember, right, I'm just going to close these errors. You'll find out as you start using uh, QGIS, you, you get a lot of errors thrown up. It likes doing that on a regular basis, uh, but it tends to still work. Uh, also, the data is slightly funny. You see, we've only really got half a square here. It's because this area here is a restricted government area, so they're not allowed to do LiDAR across it, um, which kind of helps as well for our testing but from the point of view that we're not downloading big, massive files each time. So anyway, the first thing we can see here is we've got a clear and obvious join between the two tiles. How do we fix that? Well, what you need to do is pop up to the processing tab and load up the toolbox. Once you've loaded up the toolbox, you see it's in there for me. You just need to type in merge. And once you do, for me, it's in the recently used, but for you, it'll probably be down here under raster miscellaneous. Let's give it a double click. 
Once that's loaded up, we need to add some input layers, which are our two layers. So we click this button here and we'll select both of the layers and click run. And what that's going to do is that's going to look at those two layers, merge them together. So we end up with one seamless LiDAR piece to work with much easier. And that's exactly what we're after. There we go. Uh, so that's finished. Going to close that down and I'm going to switch off the first two that we're using for now. So we've got our merge data, but it doesn't look too much like a uh, decent LiDAR right now. Um, kind of looks almost like an X-ray scan or something like that. Um, anyway, how do we get this into some usable LiDAR? Well, what we need to do is go into the style properties. And there's a couple of ways we can do that. We can double click the merged file there and pop into symbology or we can right click and go into properties but the best way would be to click this little one here which actually loads it up on the right hand side as a permanent um menu if you like i mean obviously you can close it but it's here all the time and that's important because we're going to be using it a lot as you'll see we haven't lost the processing toolbox if you still need to go back from merge it's still here layer styling has come over the top and what we need to do is change it from a single band gray into a hill shade as soon as we do that it's going to start looking a lot more like usable data if i zoom into the hill fort yeah you can see a fair bit it probably reminds you of some of the online data sources the first thing we're going to clear up is you see as we get in you can see all these little squares and that's quite annoying because I might be looking for a feature, but I'm getting distracted by all this grid work. And that's because the default way that QGIS renders um, its resampling is nearest neighbor. So over on this right hand side panel, what I want to do is I want to change it from nearest neighbor to bilinear. And I'm going to check early resampling as well, because it gives you a sort of rough preview before it fully renders it up. And there we go. It's much clearer what's going on we've got rid of all those squares so it's okay but it's not great so what do you need to do to make it better to make it usable for you well just like Karis, just like global map or any of us there's two main areas that you need to amend to make this happen technically free first you've got the altitude so the lower you are the more features may pop out because you're casting a longer shadow, but the more areas you you may cast into complete and utter darkness. The higher you are, generally the more even spread you have across, but the less shadows you have, so perhaps features aren't going to be as obvious. So you need to find a balance there by tinkering with the altitude. The second factor is the actual angle of the light, which is here. So we can adjust that. To what we need and that will show up different features depending on what the angle is and finally possibly arguably the most important is the z factor which is all about um it's similar to vertical exaggeration in global mapper and in caris so if i pop this up to 20 you'll see it very much changes it's over the top um, because you can see there's a lot of areas which are completely blacked out but you can see a lot more so where would i start off well, each, each file is different. You need to find that happy medium that works for you, but I probably start around about 12, 13. I may just drop this slightly. There we go. Uh, and then I can increase this a little bit more. So we're not too far out there, I don't think. Um, yeah, I probably start around about there-ish. Oh, also, there's a multi-directional um, element which you can select as well. And what that will do is give you light from all the way around. So the azimuth won't changing this won't affect it in any way. It'll refresh, but the actual picture stays the same. Uh, and that will give you a pretty good overview um, of the whole area. But for me personally, most of the time I like to keep it like this and work around so I can see different features. You know, it's just that little step there. The fields in this area, just south of the uh, hill fort, which are not so obvious here, just a couple of degrees around, and suddenly we've got a very clear boundary and definition. So you can bring out the the features a lot easier doing it like that. 
So we've got a pretty good um, and easy, easily workable map. We could find things in here um, that we were looking for, and you'd be well away um, straight off the bat. But what if you want to color your map, make it look a little bit prettier, define the high points, the low points? How could you do that? It's a bit more tricky in um, QGIS than it is in a lot of other applications. What we need to do is make a second layer. So head over to the left hand panel, right click the merged. And what you're going to do is duplicate the layer. Now, the merged copy, just make sure it's switched on because it doesn't by default is what's going to form a hill shade and the merged we're going to change into a color layer so from this top section not the top section from the hill shade, uh, hill shade section there we're going to choose single bad pseudo color and immediately it looks very very odd um, <laughs> but that's because it's completely layered over the top what we need to do is blend in with the layer below so pop down here to blending mode and I'm going to select multiply for this one. And you'll see straight away that we've got some color shading. We've still retained all that detail um, and it's starting to take on uh, a good life. What I would say though, the colors look wrong to me. Like the blue should be the low points for the rivers, the seas. The red should be those high points. So if, if you find that, um, one of these bandings is uh, the wrong way around, and there's a lot of them to play with as well. Um, you can certainly have a look through all of the colors, and there's more down here, or make your own. It's up to you. Uh, but yeah, say you had one like this, and you don't, you want the colors running in the other direction. All you need to do is invert the color ramp, and there we go. We've got more of a blue to the bottom and a red to the top. If we wanted the blues to be a bit more prominent, we could either change the color, that blue, and possibly change the height to so stretch it along a little bit more. When we do so, that blue is now a little bit more obvious. So that's it pretty much. Um, when you zoom in, you're going to find things that you definitely wouldn't have found with uh, some of the online data. If you want to capture this, um, all you need to do is go up to project and import export and export the map to an image uh, and you can save it as whatever you like at what file size you like um, there's also other things you can do as well but we're going to save those for another video so if you're interested in knowing how to layer over aerial photography for free or if you're interested in layering over the National Library of Scotland historical maps, the NLS historical maps for free, then those are both possible and really, really handy because you can immediately identify features because you've got an historical map overlay or you can immediately understand an area because you can see the aerial photography of it. So join me again for another one of those. And also what I just mentioned, if you are worried that you might not be able to run this software or buying a laptop or a computer to do it is going to be too expensive. It is possible to run this on lower end software. Just to prove that point, I've actually installed QGIS on my Raspberry Pi. Um, it does run across Windows, it runs across Linux and I believe Mac as well. Um, and yeah, you can see here using the same test data, I've actually, this is an aerial one, which we'll cover off in the future, but you can layer over aerial photography on a terrain map. And then if you wanted to, you could also layer on top of that um, historical maps as well. So tune in for the next, uh, the next episodes that will be coming up, how to do that. And I hope you enjoy the video. We'll catch you soon. Thanks for watching my LiDAR QGIS getting started for metal detectorist video. We'll be bringing out more and more, so make sure you like and subscribe uh, to keep up to date with the latest video.